constituents through all kinds of government bureaucracy. But these town hall meetings are going to tell you what's been going on in Ottawa. So, and then once I finish presenting roughly what happened over the last January till now, I'll open the floor for you to either ask more questions about those issues or raise anything else that's on your mind. So nothing's off limits, but I'll, first I'll start by giving you a sense of what I've been working on in Parliament. So in January, well that, oh, let me just summarize for fun some of the things that happened that were good. Why not get those out of the way? Uh, <laughs> first, I should also acknowledge that we are meeting here today on Coast Salish territory and acknowledge that with gratitude. Since Parliament began in January, I've tabled two new private members bills. One is an act to, to help small business across Canada. It would create under the uh, Minister of Industry an obligation to do an impact assessment of new legislation, new regulations, or fiscal policies for their impact on small business. So it's, a, it's an impact, it's a Small Business Impact Assessment Act. It would be under the Minister of Industry to implement it. And it's, uh, it's received very nice reaction. I did, I did work on it in advance with the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and give them a chance to look at it. I hope to pursue working on it after the election. Another private member's bill I tabled calls for all federally funded science to be made public uh, as a mandatory decision, yeah, that they would be everything publicly funded. <laughs> so that's been a, I thank you for the support. This has been a big concern to a lot of Canadians to see scientists muzzled and government science not available to the people who pay for it. I'm also pleased to let you know that the private member's bill that I put forward on Lyme disease, which is now law, it got royal assent December 16th of 2014. And the Minister of Health and I have been working on making sure that even with the intervening election, that the national conference that's mandated by my bill to develop a strategy, provincially, federally, territorially, that would speak to the need for greater awareness of Lyme disease, better tools for prevention, as well as what we really need for the medical profession to be more aware of it, to have better diagnostic tools, to diagnose it fast and to treat it is to mean that there's no long-term health impact. To misdiagnose, as some of you will know who have known anyone with Lyme disease, can cause permanent disability. So we need to also direct research. So that conference, which will involve federal provincial health ministers plus medical experts, scientific researchers, and representation from the Lyme disease patient community is now going to be taking place in mid-November. So we won't know who the government is, we don't know who the Minister of Health is, but at least while we're doing other things, we'll be working on making sure that conference is properly organized. So there we have it. Now yesterday, the House of Commons rose for the summer which given the election, I don't know when, whatever government that's elected after this election will reconvene parliament. But you get a little bit of leverage when the other parties want to adjourn early. And to adjourn early, they need unanimous consent. So that gives me, you know, there's often a request for unanimous consent for various things several times a week in parliament. And I'm not difficult, I usually give consent just to let things move along, and I like working across party lines, so I'm not, I don't, I, I'm never difficult for the sake of being difficult, but I decided uh, for this unanimous consent, we wanted two things. One was, there was a, a piece of legislation the government put through very late to create a marine <coughs> conservation area, happens to be in the riding of my only other Green Party MP, Thunder Bay Superior North, Bruce Hyde. So we wanted to get through that legislation so we could get that marine park started. And, and underway in law. And the other thing I wanted was to make sure that the Parliament of Canada took receipt of the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because I was at the, I was at the closing ceremonies for the TRC, and they took place at Rideau Hall. It's a very moving ceremony. And the Prime Minister was there, and Justin Trudeau was there. I was there. A, a tremendous number of survivors from the residential school system, representation from First Nations and Inuit and Métis. But the formal receipt of the TRC was to the government
Governor General, and there had been no conveyance of the report to the, to the Parliament of Canada. So that's why I, I did that as a request for unanimous consent in Parliament on Thursday, and I'm really pleased. That it, initially, someone said no, which meant it wouldn't have been unanimous, and the Speaker said, you don't have consent. And I could tell from the reaction of the Conservatives across the way, particularly the House Leader, John, the, who, or rather the Whip, John Duncan, that he had wanted this to go through. We, I talked to everybody ahead of time. It's never good to spring something like that on people. And the Speaker said, I heard a no from the government side. And then a lot of, it's very unusual. Usually when the Speaker says, I, there wasn't consent, they don't try again. But this time, enough Conservatives said, try again. And whoever it was who said no was, was corrected. <laughs> <laughs> the next time they asked for consent, everyone was yelling yes. So we, and it was, it was something that Chief Bill Erasmus from the, uh, who's the national chief for the Northwest Territories, had suggested to me, and I'm glad he suggested it. So I'm, I'm feeling good that, at least in the dying days of Parliament, got a couple of good things done there. Now, the other things that are less fun. Uh, the beginning of Parliament, late January, a bill that has occupied a great deal of time, of my time, and I think a lot of Canadians are concerned, is Bill C-51. It was tabled for first reading on January 30th. It was actually launched at a campaign-style rally by the Prime Minister in Richmond Hill, Ontario. I took C-51 home for the weekend and read it, and on February 2nd, which memory serves was a Monday, I had a question and question period and I was the first member of parliament, certainly the first federal party leader, to take a strong stand against C-51. And when I asked the question in question period, that that very morning there had been a very good editorial in the Globe and Mail, the first newspaper to take an editorial stance against C-51, in which the Globe and Mail editorial board described it as the secret police act. So I used that term in my question, which resulted in roars of heckling uh, that was so bad that I had to sit down. This is what I do. My, my policy of zero tolerance for heckling, many of you will know the policy I use, which is that not only do I never heckle in the House of Commons, but if I'm being heckled and can't hear myself think, I don't try to continue the question. I sit down and almost always the speaker rises, calls for order, and gives me back the floor. And that's one way I've been trying to promote greater civility in Parliament. So my first question on this was fe uh, February 2nd, opposing C-51. It was and is an omnibus bill. There are five separate pieces of legislation inside C-51. It's called the Anti-Terrorism Act. But honestly, having learned a lot more about security and the nature of how you disrupt terrorist thoughts, and what the function should be of an intelligence service or the function of an RCMP and all these different pieces of our security regime in Canada, I have to say I've learned a lot and I'm absolutely horrified by how much Canada stands alone in doing things badly. I mean, there, we have what are called the five eyes, you know, E-Y-E, -E, five eyes partners of Canada for, uh, for intelligence and sharing that intelligence. And we work with the Five Eyes are Australia, New Zealand, of course Canada, the US, and the UK. So all of our intelligence services share information with each other, at least in theory. But the Five Eyes, of, a, of the Five Eyes partners, Canada is the only one that has no oversight over what the spy agencies are doing, no parliamentary committee to keep an eye on what they're doing, no, what's called pinnacle review. No one agency or person inside the government of Canada knows what each one of these different agencies are doing. So there's the RCMP, there's CSIS, there's CSEC, which is an odd one that stands for Communication Security Establishment Canada. It's the one that does the collection of metadata, of, of going through the internet and scooping millions of downloads and that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's also the Canadian Border Services Agency. And none of these agencies have anyone who knows what they're all doing, even though they all have a piece of observing 
monitoring and one would hope disrupting a terrorist plot. The key experts that I have come to know through this process all agree that C-51 will make us less secure against a possible terrorist attack because these different agencies don't report to each other or share information with each other. And under C-51, this is what the Globe and Mail meant by secret police, we've taken CSIS, which was supposed to only be an intelligence gathering agency, and we have turned it into uh, uh, an agency empowered to go out and quote unquote disrupt thoughts, disrupt efforts to their threats to the security of Canada. But they're not required to tell anyone what they're doing. They're also able to give out immunity, promises of immunity, that if, if they're tracking someone that they think is a possible terrorist, they can say, well, if you work with us, being CSIS, we'll give you immunity from prosecution, or we'll make it, we'll give you a, a, an absolute commitment guarantee that you will never be called as a witness. Meanwhile, the RCMP can be monitoring these same people and counting on using that person as a witness. So it's really badly, badly designed if you really want to have an anti-terrorism act. It is like a, uh, trying to figure out the right metaphor, it's like a cannonball through the heart of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It absolutely removes our rights to privacy in part one, it takes away our ability to be confident that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms will be there, that if someone's being targeted by CSIS in their efforts, the bill creates the only such provision anywhere in any democratic society, which is the ability of CSIS, now empowered to go out and disrupt plots, to go to a federal court judge in a secret hearing to get a warrant to break domestic law and or to violate charter rights with no public report of how this is going on, no, super, no supervision. So it's a deeply anti-democratic piece of legislation. And the, the horrible news is that it passed the House, it passed the Senate, and it just yesterday received royal assent. So it's now law. So I believe we're going to have to repeal it because even with all the court hearings that are likely to happen challenging it, it represents a threat. A lot of that secret hearing piece is very unlikely to form a proper case where someone would have standing to challenge it because it's all so secret, it'd be very hard to show how it's disrupted and offended the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because there's no public reporting of what they've done. So skipping away from that for a moment, um, one good piece of news, I did get some amendments passed to the Pipeline Safety Act. Two of my amendments were accepted, which is not just almost never happens for me, it almost never happens for any opposition party. But the Pipeline Safety Act is not actually an act about pipeline safety, it's an act about liability for accidents from pipelines. <laughs> so what it does is it says, in the event of, it was supposed to say, in the event of a pipeline spill, the minister said, in the event of a spill, this bill says the polluter pays. Well, when the bill went to, through Parliament, when, it, when I read it, what it actually said is, this makes it possible for the polluter maybe to pay, because it creates a possibility that the government could go after the polluter after a spill. So I, I put forward an amendment, very obvious change, from the minister may seek indemnification and compensation from the pipeline company <coughs> to the minister shall. And in my amazement, the conservatives on the committee voted for my amendment, and the minister told me he liked it, so it went into the new law. The other piece that, was, that I felt good about was it, it set out that municipalities and provinces that had had expenses incurred because of pipeline spill, that they could go after the polluter. And I added to that, so can First Nations. So this, this, was, this was great because it, it did go through and it is law and it improved an act. I, I still don't think it should be called the Pipeline Safety Act, but I did manage to improve it, which is almost unheard of in our current parliament to accept opposition party and amendments, and I have no idea why they took my amendments. I grabbed those. <laughs> but, that, yeah, thank you. So other big issues. There was the vote on the extension of the bombing mission. It was supposed to be a six-month mission of bombing in Iraq. It's now extended for a full year bombing in Iraq and Syria. In order to get through this in 20 minutes, I'm just going to slide by that one. Obviously, I'm 
very concerned. I voted against it. Uh, and it will, in the, in the budget that was announced, uh, well, that's my next point is to say the budget was very late this year. Our budget came down April 21st because the Minister of Finance, Joe Oliver, postponed it. He said because he wanted to figure out how to balance the budget in the face of a falling price of a barrel of oil. Uh, the, the results, of, though, in terms of the budget, it's about $360 million that's put in there for the military campaign in Iraq and Syria. Now, the rest of the budget, climate change wasn't mentioned anywhere in the budget. Uh, other areas that I, I find astonishing are no longer even mentioned are overseas development assistance. I mean, it was interesting to see Bono met with uh, Stephen Harper on Monday. But the idea of making poverty history globally, you kind of want to know what's in the envelope for what used to be CETA, I, I, I don't know if you all know this, but Stephen Harper has eliminated CETA, and it's now a part of foreign affairs, so it's not a separate agency. They now call it, part, we used to call it Department, years ago it was external affairs. Then it went to foreign affairs and international trade, the fate, and it's now the fat D. So it's part of foreign affairs, trade, and development. So that's the fat So there, there was no mention of overseas development assistance in, the, in what's called the budget, and there was no budget for it either. Uh, just to save time of telling you what isn't in the federal budget, what the Minister of Finance tables it over the last number of years, the budget that's tabled in the spring, the document called a budget, does not contain a budget. <laughs> it, I, I think they should call it the annual spring thick brochure. <laughs> it's thick, and it contains many announcements of spending. But what's missing is knowing, okay, I'll just use the example of the Iraq and Syria money, $360 million. Well, you don't know, is that new money to the Department of National Defense? Is that pulled from somewhere else in National Defense? Is the overall budget for National Defense going down, or up, or staying the same? There's no way to know from reading the budget, because it doesn't contain a budget. Our former parliamentary budget officer, Kevin Page, made note of this, actually in this very room, when he spoke here, sponsored by my local riding association. And he said one of the principles of Westminster parliamentary democracy is that parliament controls the public purse. And he said this is no longer the case, it's quite true, because no parliamentarian knows enough about the budget to vote on it before we vote. Because you can't, you, you don't know until you've read all the main estimates, which come out quite separately and often weeks or months later. And then you need the supplementary estimates to really know what a department is spending. And even then you don't know because it does appear strange that a number of initiatives that are announced find out at the end of the year actually no money has been spent under those big announcements. So it's announced that we're going to spend money on whatever, and then it turns out that it never actually got spent. So keeping track of a real budget is, is one of my goals. Is, is there was a provision in one of the omnibus budget bills when the Conservatives had a minority parliament to allow billions of dollars of spending every year to be under a provision that they'd be deemed to have been studied, but they didn't really need to be studied. And we have to get rid of that. Uh, one of the people who lambasted that, if you want to Google and get good analysis, it was a former senator. He had to retire because he hit 75. He didn't have to retire because he was going to jail. He actually retired because he hit 75. <laughs> uh, uh, former progressive conservative Senator Lowell Murray was the one who was apoplectic in the Senate trying to stop this deeming provision. Because by that point, it had gone through the House. Well, I wasn't elected yet. So it, it had gone through the House without anybody noticing it. And Lowell Murray was blowing a whistle on it in the Senate. Anyway, back to what else happened this spring. OK, so as I mentioned, we had the budget April 21st, followed very quickly by what has become common, and I hope never happens again, an omnibus budget bill. Now, the omnibus budget bill this year was Bill C-59. And it contained, again, many separate provisions with nothing to do with the budget. There were 20 separate bills affected by the spring omnibus budget bill uh, relating to uh, interns, relating to, oh, one of the ones that came up with some public concern from the, minister, from the, uh, the privacy commissioner for the government of Canada is collection of biometric information. 
I put forward an amendment to try to, I put forward zillions of amendments to C-59 to try to fix it, but one of them was to make sure that, the, that collecting, for instance, fingerprints and iris readings, the way the bill is drafted, could apply to their new law, C-45, C back in fall of 2012, changed the permit system for foreigners coming to Canada for vacation. This has gotten very little attention. Of course, I noticed it right away because I, I grew up in the tourist industry, in the tourist business. They changed it back in C-45, and they're only implementing it now, that people who live in countries that currently do not require a visa to come to Canada will be required to apply online to the Minister of Immigration for permission to come here on vacation. And the way I read C-59, the omnibus budget bill, the collection of biometric information could apply to people who want to come here as tourists. I think this will, you know, the, the exception of countries that do not require a visa to visit Canada, the only country that will not be required to apply online to Minister of Immigration are residents of the United States because they're exempted through agreements in the Security Prosperity Partnership for trying to create a security perimeter around US, Mexico, and Canada. But, I mean, I, I'm very worried about the tourist ministry, you may know this, because we've, we've dropped in the last number of years from being the seventh most visited country in the world to the 18th. And I think part of the reason is we've stopped advertising in the, our largest market, which is the US. They've spent zero dollars on advertising in the US for the last couple of years. And then, of course, with the U.S. insisting on passports to the border, that doesn't help. And with Canada, it, Harper eliminated the rebate that tourists used to get for any GST, HST they spent here. And there's been a series of decisions that undermine tourism. That was, by the way, my only victory in the spring 2015 budget was that I had my pre-budget consultation with Joe Oliver. And it's the first time since I became a member of Parliament that my pre-budget consultation with Finance Canada was actually with the minister. Every year I've prepared submissions, and I usually only meet with Finance Canada bureaucrats, but I spent a, well, like at least 40 minutes with Joe Oliver, and one of the things I pushed hard was, the U.S. is our biggest tourist market. Tourism employs over 600,000 Canadians. It's about 3% of our GDP, or 1% more than the oil sand. And on top of that, when our dollar is an 80 cent dollar, it's a sector that stands to gain from our current low dollar. So we should be advertising like crazy in the US market because we know the value of our dollar versus the US dollar, but most people in the States don't. We need to advertise that this is the year for them to come to Canada. So Joe Alder did put in the budget a commitment to advertising in the U.S., but the budget says we don't have a dollar amount yet because we need to consult more with the tourism industry. So I'm afraid they're gonna, they've missed the 2015 summer season, but with any luck, there'll be some money and some effort soon. Okay, so that gets us through most of what was in C-59. I saved the worst for last. There are 20 different bills there, so I'm not gonna go through all of them. But the one that was the worst is one you may have seen in the news because the Commissioner for Access to Information, Suzanne Legault, has done quite a bit of media attacking this one. What C-59 does is magic away offenses committed by the RCMP in destroying data. So Suzanne Legault was very concerned as, our, as an officer of Parliament that the RCMP, well before the bill to eliminate the long gun registry had passed, was destroying data collected on the Long Gun Registry. I'm watching people back up here. So can you hear me now? I've got to remember to keep talking up for you. So the, the destruction of Long Gun Registry information violates access to information law. Suzanne Legault, as Information Commissioner, began to press the administration early that there was a crime that had happened and she wanted it prosecuted. She actually wrote to the Minister of Public Safety at the time, and this was some years ago, because the minister was Vic Taves, who's no longer in federal politics. Vic Taves gave her a written undertaking that the RCMP would not destroy data. 
But then it appears they did anyway. So here's what's happened. Bill C-59 goes back to the date when the bill to eliminate the law of that registry went to first reading, not to when it was passed, and says the access to information laws did not apply from that date forward. Now what Suzanne Legault says is, imagine, if you will, that the election laws are violated. And after an election, a majority government says, oh, those laws you thought we broke, they don't exist anymore. So post facto, retroactive elimination of laws you've already broken is a pretty dangerous precedent. What Stephen Harper said in the House was, we were just closing a loophole. The Parliament of Canada has the will to get rid of the long gun registry. And the RCMP are merely doing what the Parliament of Canada wants. Starting with, apparently, at first reading, as opposed to when the bill passed. What Suzanne Legault said, I think she's very brave, she said, look, this is a quote, this, is, this wasn't to close a loophole, this creates a black hole. <laughs> so I think she's quite brave. So that, unfortunately, C-59 did go through the House of Commons Last week, uh, it hasn't yet gone through the Senate all the way, but, um, and we'll see if the Senate is likely to push that through before they rise for the summer. We, we rose yesterday. Uh, Parliament will resume whenever the election is over. I'll just touch briefly on it if I can, maybe sure I haven't gone too long. The climate developments the last few months, they didn't happen in the House of Commons, but they are significant, in that we are going to be negotiating in a deadline context a comprehensive new climate treaty at a conference that starts November 30th. It's the 21st Conference of the Parties on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we have been meeting several times a year, but with the big Conference of the Parties once a year, every year. And I'm the only member of Parliament who's gone for years, other than the Minister of Environment. This conference needs all parties to be much more ambitious than they're currently being, by parties, I mean countries. But Canada's been about the worst. We missed the deadline. We were supposed to place our new targets with the UN within the first quarter of 2015, so by March 31st, but we didn't. Fortunately, the G7 meeting this year was held in Germany. And I say fortunately because the chair of the meeting controls the agenda. If the meeting had been in Canada, we would not have seen climate change on the agenda. But because Angela Merkel was chairing the meeting, they've been working for months on a communique that would say, we agree as the most, well, the wealthiest industrialized countries on Earth in the G7 agree that we have to get off fossil fuels altogether and be substantially there by 2050. And the word used for off fossil fuels is decarbonization. We're on a decarbonization agenda. And it was clear, I first heard about the communique and Harper's reaction to it a couple months ago, because it was well before any of you ever worked in foreign affairs and you retired here, you'll know that a communique like that for the G7 is mostly drafted well before the meeting starts. So they've been arguing over decarbonization for some time. Canada only agreed to use the word decarbonization if we eliminated reference to 2050 and said we'll be at decarbonization by 2100. Now, even with that target being 85 years out, the PMO spokespeople further refined it to say, that's merely an aspirational target. <laughs> 85 years out. The, but because of the G7 focusing on climate, that meant Canada did not want to sense, well, Stephen Harper didn't want to show up in Germany with no climate target. We didn't submit it by March 31st, which we were supposed to, but Leona Aglukov, Minister of Environment, released it on the Friday afternoon of the long May weekend, which is always a hint that they're really proud of it. Um, but <laughs> the, the new target is the weakest in the G7. It's 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, plus or minus a percentage point, that's pretty much Barack Obama's target but for 2025. So we are lower, lower targets, less ambition later, and we're prepared to say we'll be off fossil fuels maybe in 85 years. I'm very impressed, by the way, by the latest thing to come along to try to create momentum and incentive for the Paris Conference, and that 
didn't hold the pen by himself. I think, from what I'm reading, a lot of scientists were involved, a lot of bishops were involved, a lot of non-Catholics in other faith groups were involved because he wanted it to be a real in, a message to the world. And I do think he, with, I, I just wrote a blog about it, so I won't get into all the details. There's things, of course, that I will not agree with the Vatican forever. But this is worth reading. I just want to signal that to people. It's, just, it's, a, it's a significant challenge to our culture, which, as well as a demand for going off fossil fuels rapidly. OK, I'm going to stop there um, and, and open the floor to questions. Uh, we, uh, because as I mentioned, we don't have uh, mics here. That's fine. I think we're fine. It's a, it's a lecture hall. It's got good acoustics. But I will repeat your question to make sure everybody hears it. And thanks again for coming on such a gorgeous Saturday.